Hi, I'm glad you're joining the ETH podcast. My name is Jennifer Kakshuri, and with this episode, we're ending our series on uncertainty, but we're continuing the ETH podcast. In today's episode, we're talking about the usual uncertainty in research and academia. You'll hear two people with two different perspectives. My name is Eric Burns. I just recently graduated from the doctoral program at ETH. I was studying in the Department of Chemistry, and I conducted my research at the Paul Scherer Institute, which is a Swiss ETH-level domain research institute out in the middle of the farm yards of uh, farm fields of Artigau. I just finished my PhD again uh, about two months ago. So I'm, I'm really happy to look back and review some of my thoughts, especially about uncertainty. Eric, who grew up in the United States, is in the middle of the trail, finding out where to go and what to do with his degree, and he's searching for a job right now. The other guest is on the other end of the academic and work trail, but despite being a senior, she's still very active. Her name is Helga Novotny. I am a professor emerita of ETH Zurich and the former president of the European Research Council. Helga is an internationally recognized science researcher and she has been a professor of social studies of science at the ETH Zurich. She's still in various scientific advisory boards in and outside of Europe and Helga published several books. One of them is called The Cunning of Uncertainty. I have a much more positive attitude towards uncertainty than many other people. There were some moments in my life when I weighed pro and contra and I could really not decide on a rational basis. And then I thought, well, you know, this is chance and I trust in chance. And this is part of my attitude towards uncertainty. I spoke to Helga and Eric each separately. And I let Helga listen to excerpts of Eric and me talking. What is it like researching and having to deal with uncertainty, not knowing if your research will lead to a goal? Every person has a different response to facing uncertainty. For myself, I like some of the flexibility that this chaotic, uncertain environment can afford. It allows me to create. But at the same time, of course, it's super stressful. Of course, when I was doing my master's and also at the beginning of my PhD, when I wanted to continue in academia, I thought I would continue down the track. Professor, a lot of people think about that, or at least try. Your uncertain results are the same results that determine your fate. And you have to create something. But Of course, no one knows, not even yourself, what you can create. And oftentimes you don't even have full choice over the topic. So a lot of your life is determined, of course. It feels as if your life is determined. Your outcome of your performance is determined by your work. But at the same time, you know it's not. Because you know that the topic is potentially defined by other people. You also know that the limitations of the equipment or the institution or their polit politics also play a role in academia. And luck, of course, plays a really big role role as well. Helga reacted approvingly to Eric's statement. I completely agree. And this was part of the reason why I wrote the book, <laughs> because this was also my experience during the time with the European Research Council. Because as, as you know, the ERC is at the forefront of the production of knowledge. And uncertainty is exciting for scientists because it opens up what you do not know as yet. And research itself is inherently uncertain. If you know already the outcome, you are not engaged in basic research. You are applying knowledge that you already have to reach a certain goal or to provide certain answers to well-defined questions. So this uncertainty is exciting at the same time, and I agree with what uh, I heard. You know, it can be frightening because you want to succeed. You want to turn the uncertainty Certainty into something that is known. And like Eric, also Helga points out the importance of luck. Luck is uh, part of human existence, I would say. Being at the right moment at the right time or unlucky, you are at the wrong place at the wrong time. But 
Another level of luck is deeply connected to research when something totally unexpected happens and opens the scientist's eye. In science, we speak about serendipity. And serendipity means you encounter phenomenon that you have not been looking for, but, and that's an important but, you recognize their significance. And this is a very strong ally of doing science. And I've encountered many examples when scientists were speaking exactly about, uh, you know, encountering serendipity and how much it, it helped them to move along and to see things, the significance of things that they would have missed otherwise. Serendipity, or we can also call it a happy accident, can only appear in a climate of uncertainty. Having room for serendipity would be the ideal, but the atmosphere in academia is challenging for today's young researchers. There is so much more pressure on young people. There are so many different tasks, so many different dimensions that they are expected to excel in. So it's not enough to be a good scientist. You're expected to be a good communicator. You're expected to have an entrepreneurial spirit. You are expected to, you know, you, you can go on and on. And yet every day has only 24 hours and therefore it's, it's very stressful. You know, for many people, young people, they know it's publications that count and more publications and publications in these journals that are a bit higher ranked than other journals, they will get you further and it becomes very confining in a way. The pressure is there, but it becomes more confining and perhaps they're also for this reason in a, in a very rational way less daring because uh, the risks are greater. Dealing with multiple uncertainties as a young scientist is stressful. On the one hand, the pressure for results, for instance, fuels the uncertainty of getting a steady position or not. And on the other hand, to be successful in researching, you need to accept not knowing where your results might end. It's super common to talk about uncertainty amongst PhDs, postdocs, It's not so common, honestly, to talk about this with your professors. And do you uh, think this would help, though, if you could talk to professors also away from the research, if you speak about uncertainties regarding your career path? Because, I mean, that comes hand in hand with the uncertainty in the yeah. research. It's difficult for me to say. Of course, I could say on, on one hand, yes, I think information is important for people to share and access. But how to get that information, how to make it comfortable for all parties is also a, a difficult problem. And I guess part of that aspect becomes about the precarious nature of a PhD or a postdoc. You're, you're there for a short time. You are expected to excel, both internally, you expect this, but then also externally, you're hired for a short time, you need to create something. And then to complain about that uncertainty to something that, that, that I guess people feel that they took upon themselves. And then if they admit it, then they feel maybe I'm not skilled enough. It's both an ego problem for both yourself and I think also at every level, honestly, of uh, academia. But also at the same time, it's, it's a challenging, precarious situation because you have a temporary contract. You need to perform to do it. And if you say that you're not performing, then what's going to happen? There's also that level of uncertainty about jobs and uh, how well your career will advance if you actually openly advocate for that uncertainty. What crosses your mind when you hear that? Well, it reminds me of an interesting episode I had at, at ETH Zurich. There was a professor, incidentally also in chemistry, who had a PhD student And the PhD student had engaged on his PhD and together with a company. And then one day um, the company said he can no longer use the data he had been working on. So the student was desperate. And the professor said, would you like to become a supervisor of the student <laughs> together in, in a team? So I thought, well, it's an interesting experience. So I agreed. And then what I did with the student, I talked to him and I said, um, I want you to uh, write a diary on your PhD journey. And 
like many, you know, natural scientists, he wrote very short sentences, but very concise. So he showed to me what he had written, and we talked about it. Then he had another obstacle and a third obstacle. And finally, he was able to finish and everything was, was all right. But this helped him a lot. And then I insisted with the other members of the committee to accept the diary as part of the PhD. But this is very revolutionary, I Yes, assume. And, and I think it should be done much more often. And it helped him because he said in, in the diary, like he said, uh, today I went to see uh, Mr. So-and-so at the company and we discussed this and that and we agreed to that. Then two weeks later, it turned out the data, there were some data missing, so he had to go back to negotiate again, etc. So it helped him to get a more distanced view of what actually happened. And uh, it helped him also with his professor because he had documented. So the professor, of course, intervened because he, he knew the people at the company and then at the other company, etc. So, you know, I thought this should be done with every PhD. <laughs> and, but my suggestion was not taken up, but there's still room for improvement. It sounds like an excellent idea to keep a diary during the process of researching. Back to the path of the young academic Eric. He is struggling now after his PhD. The one thing that isn't really talked about so much is how do you stay on? Switzerland and the ETH domain is recruiting tremendous amounts of international students and talent from overseas to study there. And they can have a tremendous potential to contribute to the economy. Now, Employability-wise, ETH markets it themselves as a very high employable institution. Rightly so, there's a lot of very marketable skills that people get. But I think part of the problem also is that in order to then stay as an international student, especially non-EU in Switzerland, uh, is extremely difficult. You need to self-fund for that period. You almost impossible to get RAF. I, I'm not getting unemployment. I'm paying for myself for these next six months. And in addition, companies need to sponsor your visa, and oftentimes this will take through a very arduous process that makes it very difficult for them to want to hire you. And in addition to that, oftentimes it takes about four to five months, you can't start immediately, for them to sponsor you and work through all the paperwork. As Eric says, it's hard to stay on. Once you've finished your PhD, new uncertainties arise. Can these new uncertainties be diminished or even avoided in advance? ETH is still much better in this respect than many other uh, universities. And also, as a PhD advisor, I think it's part, if not of your formal, but of your moral duty to discuss with PhD students and to help them as much as possible to find their way. What is true in general, regardless of where you go, is that very few PhDs end up as professors and stay within academia. And this is something that should be communicated much earlier. Uh, instead of nurturing this uh, reproductive urge that many male professors have, you know, they want their students to be exactly like them because they think they are the greatest, to tell them it's very unlikely that you will end up instead of me in this in this place, but I will give you whatever knowledge and skills I can hand on to you to make your way in the world, and there are many more opportunities. So this has to be communicated repeatedly and much earlier. But I think it's also the duty of, uh, of the PhD advisors to, to help them. Having said that, I realize how many obstacles there are of a geopolitical nature in terms of visa. This was also much earlier for previous generations. I never, you know, worried about a visa in my whole life. So this, this is a new reality that we have to cope now. On the one hand, universities push everywhere for internationalization. You want more international students. This even becomes a cash cow for some universities in some parts of the world. And otherwise, you know, we prevent them from gaining the position that they would gain if they had another passport. 
but this is something, it's an issue that goes beyond uh, academia. It's uh, part of the geopolitical situation in which we find ourselves now. Speaking about the geopolitical situation and the state the world is in since the pandemic increased many uncertainties, Eric sees the higher education system fundamentally challenged. The higher level education industry as a whole, how will this institution change in the next decade? There's many things that I think will be changed. Coronavirus has indicated to all of us that it's now possible, in fact, actually sometimes even better for people to have digital learning. This doesn't necessarily apply to PhDs and postdocs, but are people going to be paying, especially in the United States, 30, 40,000, 50,000 for online courses? How can these organizations be more flexible, adapt to these changes? And then in, ad in addition, potentially, how can we build in an organization that can still have, you know, a rigorous high-level laboratory research environment uh, while adapting for a more fluid and flexible administration. There is no doubt the pandemic will shake up also higher education. And universities will have to face some pretty tough questions. And one of them will be now that uh, we know what is available content-wise and in terms of quality also in, in digital uh, ways. Is the university really a place that is reserved for 18 years old and until they are 24, 26? Or is this not something that is anachronistic? And we have to provide the best of content to, uh, you know, to everyone. And uh, you, you have an, another kind of academic market that will uh, arise. And uh, the on-campus experience in, in the U.S., which we don't have in, in Europe, as, as you know, because students live in town and uh, there is no uh, sorority and fraternity life and uh, so on, like on American campuses. You know, this is a historical fact that has arisen because uh, there were no, no old towns with university traditions in, in the U.S., so it may disappear again. On the other hand, laboratories will become more important. And uh, it is well possible that around laboratories, new kinds of teaching and doing research will emerge. Uh, so many possibilities are open. And uh, I don't know what the development will be, but it will shake up the higher education sector as we know it now. Would it also shake up the forms of hierarchy at universities and in research? There are people who criticize the power dynamics and the hierarchy in universities as being archaic. Well, you know, I found ETH had very flat hierarchies. And 68 was the year in which the old hierarchical university was really shattered. So there is still some way to go, but there will never be an institution without any hierarchy at all. The question is how to do it in a, in a responsible way and how to take in young people as the junior partners. And in, in a laboratory, you can easily see that people are treated much more equally because everyone has to contribute something. So teamwork will become more important. And teamwork means there is less hierarchy in a team because otherwise you end up in a military structure and that's not the most efficient. I wonder what the open possibilities might lead to in the long run. As we have realized, the pandemic reframed many uncertainties and worked as a catalyst, speeding up things that have been simmering before. Helga points out that it is essential to be connected to other scientists in similar situations and to be part of a network. As a board member of the Association of the Scientific Staff at the ETH, Eric did precisely that. The association is exclusively for mid-level scientists who represent the staff at the ETH politically and also bring people together. After his PhD, Eric stepped down from the board, but he's still part of another association called MeWell. MeWell is called the Mental Wellbeing Community. 
this organization started in the summer of 2019, before coronavirus. And I co-founded this organization with another guy. And both of us realized that there's a tremendous lack of understanding of mental health and there's a tremendous lack of discussion around mental health, particularly in academia. And we wanted to do something to change that. So we, we founded this organization. Uh, we're really happy where we are at now. We're officially recognized by Faos Ejeha, the undergraduate organization. We're recognized by Aveth, also the rectorate. We're listed on the websites. And we provide mental health awareness events twice or more a month. And we're trying to break the stigma again around mental health. Needless to say, health issues increase uncertainty in any situation, especially stressful ones. Eric experienced this himself. He suffers from a kidney disease, and during his PhD, the medication that he had to take led to difficult mental situations. That's why Eric knows how important it is to raise the awareness of mental health issues. And he's happy that people are reaching out to his association, Me Well. Eric is an active young man, ready and motivated to start working and reach out to anyone who seeks his advice or help. His frankness about struggling with uncertainty moved me. Helga, on the other side, embraces uncertainty. I mentioned at the very beginning of this episode, Helga wrote a book called The Cunning of Uncertainty a few years ago. What's actually cunning about uncertainty today? Well, it continues to be cunning, I would say. And... The pandemic has shown to us we are not as much in control as we thought. So it's a kind of healthy shakeup, I would say, to a kind of overconfidence that uh, may have led us into a more unsustainable future path in any case. Now we face uncertainty in various dimensions because very much comes together. It's not just the future of work, it's the future of the planet, it's the future of individual lives, individual careers, but also collectively. Um, you know, we have a, a, a much stronger sense of both the strengths but also the vulnerabilities of being globally connected. So this has changed, so we have more uncertainty. And, you know, the cunning means there are unexpected new perspectives that arise, new opportunities that arise. It shows the limits of our confidence in, in planning ahead. Thank you, Helga Novotny and Eric Burns, for being part of this episode. This was the last Uncertainty episode of our series, and in our series, we talked to students and ETH rector Sarah Springman about the challenging year 2020. Later, we touched on topics such as uncertainty in climate change, cybersecurity, and psychology. If you've missed any of these episodes, listen to them on our podcast feed. In the next episode of the ETH podcast, we will be dreaming of becoming astronauts. I'm Jennifer Kakshuri, together with Thies Wachter's Audio Story Lab and sound designer Luki Fretz, we bring the highlights of the ETH Zurich to your ears. <laughs>